أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد So last night we talked about one of the results of being able to apply this concept of taqwa in our lives and what happens when one is able to work on himself for not days but weeks but months but years until he reaches a point where he no longer commits that sin for him to go through the cycle of committing a sin and then repenting committing a sin and then repenting this redundant cycle and we said that that result is that this person he's sure that on the day of judgment he's not going anywhere close hellfire of course all of this is with the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the tradition says the prophet says if it wasn't for the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I also would have had issues so all of this is with the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of his rahmah he has made an agreement with himself nafsihi rahmah he has made an agreement with himself that if although my servants cannot do as much as I deserve but if they do this much I'm going to reward them. There's going to be no punishment for them. We said that sometimes when we go through this issue, a lot of people bring this up, this belief up. That, well, if I am amongst the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, then I ha basically have nothing to worry about because the hub of Ahlul Bayt is there for me on the Day of Judgment. And we said that relying on the affection and the love that one has for the Ahlul Bayt, although it is important and we might talk about it a bit more later on but one cannot be 100% sure that just because he is amongst the muhibbin of the Ahlul Bayt therefore there is nothing to worry about لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون no, that's not the case yes, the tradition said for the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib but where are the Shia? that's a different discussion right? we went through some of the attributes that the Shia have and these are some serious uh, attributes. So, the rest of us, and I'm talking about myself, that are not amongst the Shia as the Imams put it, but the Shia that we as we know it. The rest of us, what did the tradition say? They go to heaven. And God knows we don't want to be amongst those that yutaharun. Because the tathir is very different from the tathir that we do, okay? And we said that there's different ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does tathir. I'm just going over these so that we can come up to the, the point I'm going to try to make from, for tonight's discussion. He said that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to purify you in this world. Sometimes, if you don't wake up, He's going to purify you somewhere else, okay? Now before moving on with the rest of the results of applying this concept in one's life, I'm going to touch on the issue of shafa'a very quickly because the issue of shafa'a is unfortunately it's a very uh, controversial issue. And when I say controversial, I'm not, I don't mean amongst the Shia circles, no. I mean amongst Muslims in general. That if you believe in shafa'a, there's a problem there. You're going to someone else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's an issue. If you guys take a look, there's a book from Shahid Mutahari. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard the name, Divine Justice. Adl ilahi that's the Iranian title for it. Um, of course, there's different sections in the book and it's a very complicated book, so I really wouldn't suggest going through it because there's a lot of times there can be a lot of misunderstandings but there is one particular section at the end of the book I don't know if it's been translated or not which has to do with the issue of intercession and that I would recommend because it's easier to understand and there Shahid Mutahari he goes when he's going through this issue of Shafa'a he doesn't discuss it as a Shia, and that's the wonder, wonderful thing about Shaykh Mutahari. When he goes through a topic, he's not going to sit there and act as if everything is already solved. There are no questions. No, Shafa, Alhamdulillah, it's great. No, no. When he starts discussing the issue of Shafa, the first page, 
He starts. The issues that they have with Shafa is this. One, two, three, four, five. All the way till seven, eight. Shahid Mutahari, one of the beautiful things about Shahid Mutahari is this. That when he wants to discuss something, he goes out of his way to explain what the opposite side has to say in such a way where it makes sense to you. There's, there's a couple ways you can explain things, right? I can say that, yeah, this guy was here and he was saying the programs at AUF didn't make, didn't make sense and there wasn't much, much be the, most people weren't benefiting from it and that kind of stuff. I can say it like this, or I can say no. He pointed out that the topic of the speech was like this and was like that, and the examples that were given were vague. Right? Then people make sense. Oh, that's a, that's, that's, at least it's a valid comment. Shahid Mutari, when he's discussing what the opposite side has to say, he doesn't sit there and say, oh yeah, these guys say that this is shirk, but why would it be shirk? No, no. He explains it in such a way where for, your, for a second, you're like, oh, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good argument. And be before I move on, the books of Shahid Mutari, if anyone... <coughs> says, okay, I want to learn about Islam, I want to, I want to, you know, build this faith, but I want to build it with my knowledge. Where should I start? It's a question we get a lot. I want to learn, I can't come to the Hawza, where should I start? Bismillah, the books of Shahid Mutahari, yes, some of his books, very complicated, there's a lot of philosophy in there, and that I wouldn't suggest, but a lot of his books aren't like that. And Shahid Mutahari's books are a pure source. I don't think anyone else there is out there that both Imam Khawain and Ayatollah Khamenei, when they discuss his, the, pers the books of this person, Imam Khawain says there is not one book that you would find amongst the books of Shahid Mutahari that is not beneficial for the layman and for the arif. For the layman and for the arif. Meaning that Imam Khomeini himself, if he were to pick up that book, it would benefit him. Yes, it's not going to benefit him as much as it benefits me, but even him it will benefit. For the layman and for the arif. Every single book of his. And from what I remember, Ayatollah Khamenei has a very similar sentence about the books of Shaykh Nutari. So before we move on with the discussion, if anyone says, oh, I want to learn, you know, I have some time, sometimes I, I, want, have, I want to have the chance to read and learn about my religion. I can't travel 7,000 kilometers or I don't know how many kilometers away, is it? What do I do? The books of Shahid Mutahari are there. Books of Shahid, yes, I know sometimes the translation isn't the best, sometimes, but these, aren't, these are excuses, brothers. You're not there to read a novel. Where you say, oh, the translation, the wording isn't too nice. And no, 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 you're, you're not there to read uh, some sort of a novel where you take pleasure in what you're reading. You know, you're just reading for pleasure. No, no. If you want to learn, sometimes you have to read things that may not be 100% fluent. And there's no problem in that regard if you really want to learn. Okay? So this is one point that I wanted to make. Now, when it comes to the issue of Shafa'a, he starts explaining what are the issues that they have. There's seven or eight. I've only chosen three so that we can go through those and then we'll move on with our discussion. First issue that they have with Shafa'a. And these were issues I, I dealt with as a youth. It didn't really make sense to me. First of all, on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He counts your good deeds, right? And then He counts your bad deeds. So He says, for example, okay, Mahdi, you, you did... I don't know, 20 good deeds, and then you did 20 bad deeds, and... Okay, now I've decided that, God forbid, you have to go to hell. Okay. Then, all of a sudden, who comes into the picture? Imam al Hussein comes into the picture. All of a sudden, he comes and says, No, I'm going to stop you, O oh Allah. How dare you take this person to hell? when he has cried for me, when he has worn black for me, when he has taken part in my majlis, when he has love and affection for me. This is how we normally picture it. That there is one rahmah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that doesn't help us, don't worry. We have something to fall back on. What is that? The rahmah of the Ahlul Bayt. 
So all of a sudden what you end up doing is you end up picturing Imam al Hussein to be more forgiving than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are some things he can't do, but Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is so strong, he can take care of it. Like we say in Farsi, sometimes when you want to mention that there's something that's very difficult, you, no one can take care of it, you say, like, forget about God, even Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas can't do this. Right? So now you're picturing this, okay. this is one of the major issues they have with it. First issue is this, that answer to this question is, the Rahmah of the Ahlul Bayt is nothing but the Rahmah of Allah. Not that there are two, no, no, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you do not have Rahmah with me, there is no mercy for me. No. My mercy is channeled through these individuals. Either you go to these individuals and you will then deserve my mercy. If you don't come through this channel, there is not going to be any Rahmah. There is no Rahmah. That's why we say that those who know the truth and turn away from the Ahlul Bayt, they know the truth. And they turn away from the Ahlul Bayt, their fate is going to be a very difficult fate. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I've channeled my mercy through these individuals. Right? Not that I have this mercy and then if you want more, you go to him. No, no, no. My mercy goes through him. <coughs> if you go through him, you have my mercy. If you don't, of course those who don't know the truth, they don't hear about the message, all these things. That's a different discussion. The mustada'af, al-mustada'af fikriyan wa aqa'idiyan, that's a different discussion. We're talking about someone who knows. Someone who knows. He turns away from this channel, there is no rahmah. Not that there's rahmah, but there's a little. No, there is no rahmah. So the first thing is, we need to understand that the Rahmah of the Ahlul Bayt is nothing but the Rahmah of Allah. And the Rahmah of Allah is only channeled through who? Through these individuals. That's number one. Second question. So what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favorites. He sits there and he says, okay, if you follow these individuals, you're good to go. But if you don't follow these individuals, I'm going to kill you or send you to hellfire. Does he have favorites? Let's dissect this a little bit. When someone has favorites, let's say I'm a, I'm a professor, right? Just like some professors, I'm gonna have favorites. So for example, who are your favorites gonna be? My favorite is going to be this guy, he's a relative of mine. He's a far, like, he's the cousin of my cousin of my cousin of my cousin of my cousin, okay? And then there's this other guy, his father is rich, he's wealthy, so he's also going to be my favorite. This other guy, he has a lot of authority, this guy is going to be one of my favorites. Question, if other people want to be like your favorites, can they do that? They can't do that. Hmm? The guy beside him, he's poor. Or he's an average person in terms of his wealth, his financial set. He can't be like the person that is your favorite. But when you come to the issue of the Ahlul Bayt, it's not like that. The Ahlul Bayt aren't asking for something you cannot do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says, go through the Ahlul Bayt, He doesn't say, go and bring me this much money. No, no, no. Anyone can do this. So it's very different from having favorites. When you have a favorite, because this person is your relative. Other people can't all of a sudden become your relative. No, it's not up to them. Your relatives are these individuals. Hmm? But when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not asking for something like that, that you cannot make happen. You can do it. This is second, number two. Number three and the most important. Allah, someone goes and does their homework basically. Allah, we've went through the verses of the Qur'an. The Qur'an says, لا ينفعهم أو لا تنفعهم On that day, there is no shafa'ah, there is no intercession. Whatever you have with your own actions, We've heard that even the mushrikeen back at the time of the Prophet, this is what they used to say. They used to say that we do not worship these idols as gods. That's not how we worship them. No, no. We know there is one God. 
That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, tells the Prophet, if you ask them who created this world, Allah. they will say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this place. So why do you worship these idols then? You would think that the, these idol worshippers, they're worshipping these idols as gods, right? As people who, let's say, helped God to create the world. But that's not the case. They knew that there is only one God that created the earth. So what was their issue? No, their issue was they are shufara. If you worship this idol, he is going to do shafa'at for you on the day of judgment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it gets a bit more difficult. Because up until now, I said these people are bad people. They are mushrik. Hmm? But no, they also believe that there is Allah. They only said that what? We worship these idols because they are shufa'a. They will do shafa'at of us when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember a teacher mentioned this uh, in class and for a 30, I remember for a couple minutes it took, it didn't click for me. Then when it clicked for me, I was like, oh, oh well, that's, that sounds kind of like what we would believe in. Now, other than the fact that we don't worship the Ahlul Bayt and all that stuff, <coughs> the answer to this question is this. This is how Shahid Mutahari puts it. He says, listen, when you go through the Qur'an, the Qur'an, yes, it negates any sort of shafa'ah that is of the batil shafa'ah. He says, we have the shafa'ah to batil, and then we have shafa'ah to haqqin. Okay, now these are terms. What do these terms mean? He says, listen, when it comes to shafa'ah, you can picture it in two ways. Okay. Shafa'ah to batil, and what does that mean? That means that the person at the bottom who wants to get to the person who's at the top, he's the one that initiates the process. He's the one that initiates the process. What do I mean by that? Let's say you want, to, you want the principal to do a favor for you. Hmm? What you do for shafa'at al-batil is this. You initiate the process. You say, okay, I'm going to go find his husband, her husband, or I don't know, his wife. Hmm? And I'm going to give her a gift When she likes me She will tell her husband to Take care of the favorite for me Who's initiating it? You are Okay This is shafa'atu batil But shafa'atu haqqin ma huwa? Shafa'atu haqqin is this That you don't initiate the process Who initiates it? Initiates from the top it goes from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom to the top. So what does that mean? You're sitting there, you say, I want to get to that principle. The principle himself turns around to you and says, listen, you want me to take care of your favor? Okay, now you go to this person. If this person is okay with you, then I'll be okay with you. No, but if you have issues with this person, then I'm going to have issues with you. So it's a difference between us initiating this process of intercession and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initiating this process. Yes, if we were to sit there, if I were to choose someone else instead of the Ahlul Bayt, I say, okay, I want to choose, uh, I don't know, some, some brother I met somewhere. Right? He will do shafa. No, you're, you're initiating it. That's, that, it doesn't work like that. But if he initiates it and he tells you where to go, that's a different story. So these are the three. When I went through the questions, I felt like these are the three main questions that one needs to take into consideration when we're talking about the issue of shafa'ah. Now I'm going to go back to the discussion that we have. The results of carrying out taqwa in our lives. Yesterday we said you can stay away from hellfire. The second result is this. When a person is able to stay away from the haram and he continues on this path, because he builds faith with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a lot of the radha'il, they start moving away. You don't have to push for these radha'il to, to move away. These bad attitudes, these bad habits. You don't even have to push. They start going away themselves. I'm going to give you three examples. First example, paying attention in prayer. Whoever's 
struggled with this, you can raise your hand. I'm pretty sure everyone is going to pretty much. It's so difficult that they have this analogy. They say, okay, you know what? When you go to pray, where do you stand? You stand in the mihrab. Where, what, does the, what is the root word of mihrab? Harb. There's a war going on. There's a war going on. Once you step there, I'm sure you guys have felt this. Once you step in there, even before that you can pay attention. Even before that you can take a tasbih and do the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But once you step into that mihrab, your thoughts go in every single corner. They are so scattered. You find all the things that you lost a couple months ago. But if someone builds faith with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't have to push. No, when he stands there, little by little he will feel that, oh, now my thoughts aren't so scattered. If he continues down that path, you'll see, oh, it's like I'm talking to my friend. Not like a holy friend, no, just a normal friend. Goes one step further, then he's like, oh, I have to talk to this friend. Paying attention in prayer. This is just an example. Second example. Being firm in the path that you have. Having itminan. Taking things that you're that you have you have accepted in terms of theoretically, right? Theoretically you have accepted. But when it comes to practice, you still see, oh, I haven't really accepted this. Like for example, I'm sure you guys have heard this story where Imam Hussein on the way to Karbala, the Imam had a dream. And during the dream, he saw that someone on the horse pointed to the caravan and said, these people on the caravan, in this caravan, they're moving where? They're moving towards death. And there's no coming back from this. So the Imam woke up. Right? We've all heard this story. That the Imam wakes up and he brings it up with Ali Akbar. And Ali Akbar says, okay, well, if we're moving towards death, are we on the right path? Hmm? The Imam says, yes, we're on the right path. What does the, Ali Akbar say? Idan la nubali bil maut. He's reached this certainty where it doesn't matter to him. If they were to ask us, what is the textbook answer when they tell you that you're going towards death and you're not coming back, we would give the same answer. The textbook answer. What's in the book? Okay. But when we get into that battlefield, not just our hands, our whole body will be shivering. And that's natural. But Ali Akbar has worked on himself till he reaches a point where he has that itminan. Okay, I'm not going to talk about Ali Akbar because it's easy to talk about Ali Akbar and say that Ali Akbar was like this. Ali Akbar, some of us might think, oh, his father was an imam. How dare you bring that up? You know, Ali Akbar is different. Okay, we're not going to talk about Ali Akbar. There's another person that we all know. Imam Khomeini, when he stood up against the regime in Iran, he was arrested basically, right? So he was arrested from Qom and they dro drove him to where? To Tehran, to basically take care of things. And on the way, I don't know if how many of you guys have been to Qom or Tehran, on the way there's this lake and it's not really a lake, it's just full of salt because it's very dry there. And they call it Daryochaya Namak. So on the way, they stopped at the lake. And Imam Khwain, this is himself speaking. He says they stopped at the lake for a second, and for a second, what went through my mind is well, there's a good chance they're going to kill you right here. Because they just want to get rid of you. And he says that while I was thinking that there's a chance they're going to kill me, then I looked to myself and I said, I'm not afraid of that. There is no fear in me when it comes to this. How does he do that? We can sit here and say Imam Khwaini was this great and Imam Khwaini was that. No, no. But the question is, how do you become that great? Hmm? It's because when Imam Khomeini was younger, he was younger, he started from the bottom. When you start from the bottom and you reach the top, 
then yes, your beliefs, whatever you think of theoretically, it's going to be in your heart. But yeah, someone like me, who's not there yet, I might accept a whole bunch of things theoretically, but it's not going to reach my heart. One more example and we're going to move on. Another example is disregarding what people like and what people don't like. What people like about you and what people don't like about you. The liking or disliking of people. This is again one of those issues. Unless, it doesn't matter, you can, you can be a great person for 20 years. Unless you stay away from haram and you work on that, you will never reach a point where the like and the dislike of people will be the same for you. You'll never reach that point. There is no other way. الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسِ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing a group of the mu'mineen. He says, those people that they come knocking on their doors and they say, listen, people have gathered against you. الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسِ إِنَّ النَّاسِ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ They've gathered against you. فَخْشَوْهُمْ Be afraid of them. What happens to them? فَزَادَهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَقَالُوا حَسْفُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ Not only is it okay with them, but their iman becomes greater. This is not for our level, brothers and sisters. No, this is someone who's worked at the bottom, he's made his way all the way to the top. Yes, when you reach that top, the adversary you go through, that will increase your iman. Please decide a salawat. One might think, Shaykhna, I, today I didn't do anything wrong. But when I started to pray, I wasn't paying attention. Hmm? When I started to pray, Shaykhna, I've been, like the, I've been a good person. And by being a good person, I don't mean a generally good person, no. For a week, let's say, I've been looking into my life, making sure that what my tongue says and what you know, my actions are doing, and my income, and all this, this all, it's all correct. But I'm not seeing any results. What, do you, what are you talking about? Aga, oh, this, as they say in Farsi, Aga, oh, this takes years. Hmm? This is a lifestyle. It's not something you want to do for two weeks and then see the angels. Right? As a, one of the speakers used to say, he says, this, the, the youth, they expect themselves to do this for like two weeks, and then they say, I have become Uddatul Arifin. I am now. No, no, you continue. Let me give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for a number of reasons, for a number of reasons, He does not show you results quickly. No one has promised that. The only thing you know is that you have to put your head down and you have to continue down this path. Results come or they don't come, that's a different issue. That's not what you have to worry about. Guidance, does it come or doesn't come? That's not what you have to worry about. The results come from him. You don't have to worry about that. Okay? Let's take, for example, the story of the Ashab, Ashab al Kahf. Right? They prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they were running away from the king, they didn't know what to do. Right? You guys have heard the story. That these guys ran away for so long, the traditions say that their feet were bleeding. And they couldn't even feel it. They stopped and then they said, Oh, our feet are bleeding. The same way if a wolf is attacking you, you're going to run, you're not going to feel anything, right? These guys ran, they went into the cave, they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they asked Him, Oh Allah, send a rahmah for us. إِذْ أَوَى الْفِتْيَةُ إِلَى الْكَهْفِ فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً Send us a mercy from yourself. Because things had become very difficult for them. Take, take care of things and send, them some, send us some sort of a guidance. Okay, this is a prayer of Ashab al-Kahf. What are you expecting? I've been a good person for a week. I've been a good person for a month. When did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer their, their prayer? فَضَرَبْنَا عَلَىٰ آذَانِهِمْ فِي الْكَهْفِ السِّنِينَ عَدَدًا When did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer their prayer? They woke up hundreds of years later. And we can't wait for a week. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never promised you and me that if you ask for something in particular, He's going to give it to you right then. No? Yes. What we do know is that if someone prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I need this, I want this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not put his prayer, leave his prayer unresponsed, right? We have traditions saying that either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to you, فَبِهَا ni'mat. If he doesn't give it to you, either he will delay it, or he will give something else instead, or he won't even give you anything, he'll make sure this bala will not come to you, a calamity will not befall you. And if nothing like this happens, he will reward you on the Day of Judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not promising that if you sit there and you say, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I've been good for two weeks, I need, you know, this, I need to pay attention in prayer, that's not going to happen necessarily. فَذَرَبْنَا عَلَىٰ أَذَانِهِمْ سِنِينَ عَدَدًا these guys, they slept for 300 years. Then when they woke up, they still didn't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has responded to their call. When they, wrote, when they woke up, they turned around to each other and said, how much you sleep? And the other guy turned around to the other, how much you sleep? Sometimes when, when you sleep too much, you don't know. How much you sleep? Half a day. How much you sleep? A day. One of them, because he had reached a higher spiritual level, he said, no, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how much we have slept. He felt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had carried out a miracle with him. He felt it. That's why he said, no, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how much. So brothers and sisters, it's consistency is the key. This has to be our lifestyle. It's not a two-month thing. It's not a three-month thing. No, no, no. It has to continue, inshallah, for us. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Tonight is the night of another character that is going to become Shaheed in the plain of Karbala. Another character that is going to leave pain and grief for Imam al Hussein. Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. And these are two brothers that inshallah the brother is going to talk about tonight. Aoun and Muhammad. And we know that Fatima al Zahra she visits these majalis. The majalis of her son. The ulama tell us that she visits the majalis of her son. And when she hears the name of Aoun and of Abdullah, the Lady Fatima al Zahra is not just sitting there. No, these names bring pain and grief to our mother. <coughs> We've heard the story of how Aoun and Muhammad come to Imam al Hussein, they ask for permission. Some of the narrations say that Lady Zainab had taught them that listen, if Hussein does not allow you to go to the battlefield because he's ashamed, you do qasam by the right of Fatima al Zahra. If you do right, if you do qasam by the right of Fatima al Zahra, Hussein will have no choice but to let you leave. And we've heard the story that they go to the battlefield and the only time that Lady, Fatim, Lady Zainab does not run out onto the battlefield is this time. Because she knows that Hussein will feel ashamed if Zainab runs to the battlefield. But I don't want to talk about Aun and Muhammad tonight. There is another shaheed that when I talk about him, I truly feel ashamed to go through the musibah of this person. And that is Abdullah ibn Hassan, the other son of Imam Hassan. Imam Hussein had told Zainab the day before that when I go to the battlefield, these children, if they see any of what's going on, they will not take it. They will want to be with their uncle. 
They will run into the battlefield. Zainab, it's your responsibility to watch out for these kids. It's your responsibility to make sure none of them comes into the battlefield. If any of them comes into the battlefield, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's going to happen to them. They say that the Imam goes to the battlefield. One of these kids, these young kids, comes from in between the tents. He comes and he stands by Lady Zainab. Lady Zainab has just said farewell to Hussein. She herself is in pain, in grief. As Zainab sees this child, she takes his hand because Hussein has told her, you have to watch out for the kids. Hussein is fighting, going to one corner, coming back, saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, going back, fighting again. All of a sudden, Zainab sees that this young child, he's pulling his hand. This young child cannot take it anymore. They're attacking his uncle. He pulls his hand, Wallah, la ufariqu ammi. I swear I will not let my uncle be alone like this. The child starts running to the battlefield. Zainab doesn't know what to do. Hussein doesn't know what to do. He runs. Someone wants to strike the Imam. Yabn al Khabitha, what do you think you're doing to my uncle? He comes to strike the Imam. Abdullah is there. His hand is caught up in the middle. He cuts the hand of Abdullah. Abdullah falls into the hands of Abu Abdullah. And Abu Abdullah is there. The pain of losing 70 of his companions on one side, the pain of losing Abdullah in his hands on the other side. And he starts t speaking to Abdullah. He says, Abdullah, be patient. Be patient. This what is happening to you. It's your khair is in this. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what went through the heart of Abu Abdullah, what went through the heart of Zainab on that day. Allah la'natullah ala al qawm al talameen wa sayya'lamu al ladheena talamu ayyamun qalabin yan qalabun.